Thank you, everybody. And thank you very much for inviting me to be here. And thank you very much for the funding. Uh, so before I thank the funders, though, I want to thank the science team. So uh, I, in a minute, I'm going to show that Deep Carbon Observatory had a 30 to 1 or more leverage on this project. Part of the reason for that is that these 250 registered members of the team, of whom about 150 were present on the drill site and or on the drilling vessel CQ to describe the core, no, none of these people were paid anything. And they didn't even get any research funding. So, you know, if you build it, they will come. Uh, and I'll just point out, you know, this is roughly the number of people at this meeting. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to try and tell you what they did. Okay, so the funders, Deep Carbon was the first mover. Uh, and uh, then International Continental Drilling Program. NSF was uh, the second largest contributor. NASA, JAMSTEC, so that's Japanese Marine Science and Technology Center. Lots and lots of support in kind and in dollars. Uh, the I IODP TAMU, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, German Science Foundation, Swiss Science Foundation, European Research Council. So it's a truly uh, international effort. Uh, in Oman, we've been really helped by the Water Ministry, Sultan Qaboos University, the Public Authority for Mining, the German University of Technology in Oman, and uh, Petroleum Development Oman. As you probably, many of you know, the uh, coast of the Gulf of Oman, stretching up towards the Straits of Hormuz here, is underlain by the world's largest block of oceanic crust and upper mantle thrust onto a continental margin. And it's been very well studied. In fact, basically, um, it's almost sort of frightening to contemplate how fully our idea of what the Pacific Ocean crust is depends on this section, even though the Oman Ophiolite probably didn't form at a normal mid-ocean ridge. OK, so we have uh, a bunch of drill sites here. We had three sites in the crust, one at the uh, sheeted dike to Gabbro transition, two in the, sorry, two in the lower crust. Uh, then we had two, two boreholes in the uh, crust mantle transition zone several boreholes, which I'll spend quite a bit of time talking to if I have time, uh, in this so-called active alteration site, and one through the basal thrust of the ophiolite and into the underlying metamorphic sole. So in all, we have 3.2 kilometers of core. And maybe I won't take the time to read to you all these things, but the holes were between 300 and 400 meters. And we had 100% recovery. Sometimes get big, long sticks, one core barrel full of intact core. It's, uh, <laughs> this, I think this is the biology lab on board Chiku, filled up with core. And um, it's quite a logistical challenge to deal with all this rock. But I just want to invite all of you, or any of you, to take part in this project as it goes forward. The uh, working half of the core is at the American Museum of Natural History. The archive half is stored in Oman. Uh, for the next year or so, um, the Oman drilling project will be uh, dealing with sample requests, and after that, the sample requests and archival uh, storage will be uh, done by the American Museum of Natural History for forever. I just want you to know that there's a meeting, uh, so it's sort of the capstone meeting for the Oman Drilling Project, but of course, we're happy to have scientific contributions on other topics as well. And uh, it'll be in, at the Sultan Qaboos University between the 12th and the 14th of January. There are field trips before and after. It's kind of modeled on the 1990 conference on ophiolites and uh, oceanic lithosphere in Oman. And uh, so the registration deadline is coming up. Uh, right now, we have about 130 abstracts. If you really, really want to present something and you miss the abstract deadline, send me an email. Uh, there's also a special collection in the Journal of Geophysical Research. It's open for submissions now. Anything on ophiolites and oceanic lithosphere, including uh, subduction mass transfer and deformation at the base of ophiolites, is welcome. We're hoping this uh, collection will be equal in kind of impact to the 1981 uh, special issue of JGR on the Oman ophiolite. So send your submissions, please. Uh, as I said, the, the things will be published on a rolling basis. I'm hoping we'll produce a paper volume 
on the 40th anniversary of the 1981 volume. Okay, so here are the three crustal drill sites, lower crust, mid crust, that Gabbro transition. There's not a lot of a carbon story here, so I'm not going to dwell on this, but uh, these holes, eventually the data from these holes will help us differentiate between these rather different end member scenarios about how the oceanic lower crust forms at spreading ridges, either as a kind of viscous Gabbro glacier or as a series of sheeted sills at the depths, with, crystallize at the depths where we find them now. Uh, so, and then associated with that is our big questions about how deep the hydrothermal cooling at mid-ocean ridges goes. And so just some initial results here uh, from GT1 and G, so the lower crust and the mid crust, uh, we found that uh, low temperature alteration minerals were abundant throughout the core. And uh, this includes uh, uh, anhydrite, so calcium sulfate, which has been mysteriously absent from shallower crustal drilling in the oceans. It could be a very, very important part of the carbon cycle. We haven't been able to date this stuff, but it has strontium isotope ratios that are consistent with formation from Cretaceous seawater. And indeed, there are zeolites that also have strontium isotope ratios that are consistent with Cretaceous seawater, so it looks like the hydrothermal system got down to the base of the crust and to very low temperatures near the ridge axis. We, I personally spent a lot of time and really love this hole through the basal thrust. It's of interest to you guys because most of the core, these orange bands labeled L here, are listvanites. Nobody ever heard that word before. Oh, it's misspelled too. But uh, listvanites are fully carbonated peridotites. Every single magnesium and calcium atom has made friends with the CO2. So they're magnesite quartz or dolomite quartz with uh, iron oxides and some uh, fuchsite. The, uh, amazingly, there's this huge range. Here's quartz, dolomite, magnesite. These are bulk compositions calculated in terms of mineral proportions. We've got XRF scanner data. This is the log histogram here uh, in the colors. And then the average uh, XRF shipboard analysis there in, in green. And average Samael peridotite from people's work all over the ophiolite over the years in blue. So you see that even though there's this giant amount of lithologic variability, the average composition sits very, very close to average Oman upper mantle peridotite. And in turn, unless you really want to stand on your head, this seems to imply that there's been uh, something in the order of a 40 or 50 percent volume increase during the process of adding CO2 and calcium and some other things to these rocks. And we can ask how is that volume increase accommodated? Uh, we see in the core and in the field, there's a serpentinization front that seems to be going out ahead of the carbonation front. And so maybe the expansion at the serpentinization front forms a system of cracks that in turn allows ingress of the fluids that cause the uh, full carbonation of the rocks at this second front. Uh, don't you love people try to show these kind of EQ36 plots in a hurry? But uh, so the first thing you can see here is that so serpentine here in these red zones is out uh, at the low water rock end of these fluid flow models compared to the green zone where we have magnesite quartz in the abundances that form listvanite. Moving a little forwards, this is kind of an unexpected result. So we found that uh, in order to get magnesite and quartz in the observed abundances, we needed to model fairly, uh, fairly CO2-rich aqueous fluids as the incoming reactant. And in turn, these fluids have cal uh, CO2 concentrations that are higher than fluids in the sediments immediately underlying the ophiolite at, let's say, 5 kilobars and uh, 200 degrees C. So this is a higher pressure fluid source. And the, OK, uh, I, I wish I could talk more about this. We see quartz intergrown with serpentine and carbonate. Many of you might think that's illegal, but actually that's OK at maybe 80 degrees or 100 degrees C. Uh, and, uh, and then we also see hematite, uh, composite hematite veins with this black, soft carbon stuff that we call graphite on the drill site. It's actually amorphous carbon material. And uh, you might think that it's impossible to have hematite together with graphite, but that's not true either. 
Again, at very low temperatures, these two uh, can coexist. But this phase, or this phase assemblage seems to require a water-rich fluid, whereas this one seems to require a CO2-rich fluid. And so one possibility is that there was unmixing of fluids as they rose up along a uh, permeability boundary along this subduction zone. OK, I'm not going to dwell on the crust mantle transition zone holes, although you know this is the first continuous sample of the oceanic crust mantle transition. And then let's look at the active alteration, because that's of more interest to you folks. Uh, first of all, we can ask the question, OK, well, so here's the boreholes, the cross section. Here's the moho. Our three boreholes are here below the moho, associated with this large uh, dunite body within the mantle section of the ophiolite. There are, uh, one, there are four cord boreholes here, and Sorry, three cord boreholes here and four rotary boreholes, six inch boreholes for packer experiments and other kinds of hydrology testing in this area. And we're really hoping, and again, this community might be interested in this as a legacy site. There's tons to do here. Okay, so is the alteration really active? And I'm showing you this plot from Tom McCollum's recent review. Uh, and he's pointing out that especially the more modern experiments, for example, his own, uh, show very, very low serpentinization rates or conversion rates of olivine to serpentine at temperatures below uh, 200 degrees C. Whereas, okay, so we see these uh, intergrown carbonate and serpentine veins. The latest sets of veins are these calcite or sometimes dolomite veins and these so-called waxy serpentine veins, which are all often uh, nanocrystalline. And they're uh, clearly roughly coeval in time. So looking at the borehole water today, you see here's uh, PA, our FO2 calculated from EH, uh, pH, and temperature in blue. OK, and here's the dissociation limit for water. Uh, and then we see pH on the top diagram and in red. And you see that the water in these holes gets to very, very high pH as a characteristic of reaction of water with peridotite at low temperature and low water rock ratios. So uh, it turns out that the abundance of calcite veins in the boreholes are very strongly, is very strongly correlated with the pH of the water in the boreholes today. So that, in a way, that seems obvious. But think it doesn't have to be that way. If the calcite were ancient, there's no reason why it would have to correlate with the present day borehole water compositions. OK, looking at the FO2, we see indications in the core that there's an oxygen fugacity gradient in the core as well. So the tops of the cores are these orange rocks with almost entirely ferric iron. There's this black zone, which is, I think, a zone with a lot of nanocrystalline uh, sulfide, as sulfate is descending through the oxygen fugacity gradient, and we form this sulfide precipitation zone, and then the bottom of the core actually has some relict mantle minerals and uh, much uh, greener serpentine. In those assemblages, we see uh, things like hazelwoodite, native copper, and awarolite, so iron nickel alloy. And these things are recording oxygen fugacities less than 10 to the minus 75 bars, which is consistent with the very, very low oxygen fugacities that is recorded in the borehole water today. And in fact, these mutually cross-cutting relationships between the serpentine and the carbonate show us that not only the carbonate veins, but also the serpentine, the waxy serpentine veins, which go throughout the depth interval in the holes, are young. And so uh, 30, something like 23 of 32 samples was carbon datable. OK, so looking at the kinetics again, uh, first of all, if I just, I just did this you know, with, in PowerPoint. But uh, if you extrapolate these uh, rates out uh, to lower temperature, uh, actually, in the geological world, 1% per 1,000 years is really not such a slow rate. So one possibility is that we're just looking at the accumulation of these serpentine veins over thousands of years. Also, there's some indication that uh, high pH or aluminum-rich conditions lead to rapid serpentinization. 
And finally, we're all, well, the community is sort of all coming up with other reactions that can form serpentine that doesn't, don't involve olivine. For example, reaction of brucite with aqueous silica to, to form serpentine. So stay tuned. Uh, so Mitch said I would show one biology slide. Here it is. Uh, <laughs> But thanks to a big team, but led by, very ably led by Alexis Templeton. They came out, they built this uh, microbiology shed. There's a, a glove box in there, nitrogen-filled atmosphere. So we take this incredibly dirty core and all of a sudden put on blue gloves and carry it over. But, uh, <laughs> so, and we, we had microspheres in the, in the drill fluid, so uh, we're somewhat able to detect where the, where the drilling water did and did not go. And, um, you know, so all I can say is stay tuned. Uh, just this last winter, we took delivery of this Packer system. And so this is just getting going, but there's tons of things we can do to test the, hydro the permeability and other hydrological characteristics of this region. And we can, in fact, we've already by accident done some hole-to-hole -hole experiments, and surprisingly, over 100 meters, these uh, boreholes are, are hydrologically connected on this time scale of minutes. Uh, so that's probably good for us. And then the latest thing, and maybe one of the most exciting things I'm going to tell you, uh, Rob Sohn has installed uh, a bunch of hydrophones in one of these boreholes. And uh, to see if we have this notion that, you know, the space problem for these volume expansions, am I over time? Okay. The space problem for these volume expansions is, is, caused, is uh, solved by so-called reaction-driven cracking. So we put these hydrophones out to see if we could hear it. And just in the day or two of deployment, Rob detected a whole bunch of these impulsive uh, sort of explosive events. So he got extra money from NSF, and we're going to deploy surface instruments this coming winter to locate and uh, see where these events are happening and get a better idea about the waveforms and the mechanisms. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Do we have one quick question? Well, there's no time for Very that. quickly. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So you showed that in these veins, there's this relationship between the amount of calcite and the pH. But it was higher pH led to less calcite. Yeah. And I would have guessed the opposite. I would guess that more alkaline conditions oh, well, would lead to think, more calcite. Think, calcite. think so like a reaction path person. That? So as the surface water was saturated in air, let's imagine, um, descends through that pH gradient, it's going to precipitate calcite all the way down the gradient. And by the time you get to pH 12, there's hardly any CO2 left in the water. And we see that. I mean, we can sample the water. That is a fact. It used to be zero carbon in that water. Now we can measure it, but it's low. Thanks very much, Peter. Can we thank him again? Thank you. <clears throat>